Coffee, and we are doing playtime, and we're talking about um, why plays work. And the first play that we're doing is Failure, A Love Story. And I'll talk a little bit more about why and all of that. But that's one of the scripts that um, Wordsmith started with and then, um, and then kind of launched into a whole series of productions across the US. And I'm William Dole. I'm a proud member of the Dramatist Guild of America. And currently, it's Houston Regional Rep and a board member at, here at Wordsmith, which as you all know, promotes new works by, by playwrights from around the world. Um, so I wanna get, I, I, Melissa and I talked about this and we wanna start to give you a, a short summary of the play in case you haven't read it because many of you may not have read it or seen it. Um, it's, and this, this little summary comes from uh, Margaret Downing uh, from a 2014 news article she wrote as editor in chief of the Houston Press prior to the stages theater production of it. And I'm gonna pretty much quote it verbatim. This is the story of the three fail sisters whose immigrant parents make it to America only to die in a car wreck um, in their new hometown of Chicago. Each of the daughters is loved and lost in turn by Mortimer Mortimer, that's his name, Mortimer Mortimer. Each daughter is distinctive and special the eldest takes over the father's job as an expert clock worker and oversees their clockwork shop. The middleest, as they call her daughter, is an expert swimmer who trains to swim across Lake Michigan and nearly makes it. The youngest daughter is an expert engraver. Um, in, this, in this play, the grand themes of love, death, and the transient nature of life are tackled on a minimalist stage and in a way both practical and magical. Uh, set in the late 1920s, the play includes music of the time, like Let Me Call You Sweetheart, um, for example, as well as instruments rarely seen anymore, the melodeon, the harmonium. Uh, despite the deaths, Leslie Swackheimer, who directed the 2014 performance at Stages, says the story is really about how people embrace life, that and the fact that the people around you aren't going to be here forever. In the play, a gramophone is conjured by, conjured by a person blowing into a horn while a bright green scarf becomes a parrot. It was a quote from, from Leslie Swackheimer. How do I make a car wreck on stage with no car? How does somebody swim across Lake Michigan on stage? And she added, this playwright trusts the audience and invites them to use their imagination. So I think, I think Melissa was gonna talk a little bit about the cast notes in the play um, to give you an idea of what's going on. Um. Yeah, well, and I wanted to start and say, um, so this play was done, yeah, after Wordsmith, I don't, I think within a year it was done at Stages, and then it went on, I think it has been produced in Chicago itself as well, Victory and, Garden. Um, probably, I think around 20, 25 productions, so anyway, um, the play, so when he says, um, you just said, I think you were going, some of the things you were going to talk a little bit about the cast notes, some of the things mm -hmm. about, um, you know, we, we, were, we, we were going to riff a little bit on the direct, the how great it would be to direct this play, be both fun, yeah. fun and challenging. So um, when he starts out uh, with how you should cast the play, you can kind of cast it with any number of shapes, any number of people, any number of puppets. <laughs> Um, you can assign ca chorus characters to actual characters or characters to chorus members. Um, you, he says, uh, you want two dead parents to comprise the chorus. Oh, they're dead. Spoiler alert. Go for it. You want a trio of hear, no, see, no, speak, no evil monkeys narrating the story. Rock on. So you can make it as simple or as complicated as you want to. So right from the get beginning, he gives like this total freedom with the script. Uh, which is important because the play is rather wild and complicated. <laughs> <laughs> like there's a there's a chorus at the beginning and and um, I mean it, it basically it, a director can decide to make like like Melissa said many people members of the chorus or are, are cast members uh, I mean the, the major characters members of the chorus and so what I found really interesting about this, what, one of the things is that one of my favorite playwrights, Edward Albee, once said something along the lines, 
that you need to protect your stage. Uh, you need to add sufficient stage directions to kind of dummy proof a, a bad director from doing a bad direction of your play. And I agree. Uh, I understand where he's coming from because I, after all, Edward Albee has had literally thousands of productions of his various plays. And so undoubtedly he has seen some real clunkers and I can see even early in his career making that decision. But there's something really empowering that Philip Dawkins is doing here by generously offering directors um, to do whatever they want. And it's also a little strategic strategically astute if you're giving a, if you have a play that you can give a director that kind of leeway you should make it clear up front because that's going to pique the interest of directors yeah it makes it so that that idea of like having to scale the play small to be produced in a small theater and then as big as you want for people with big budgets it kind of um just jumps right over that into the creative sphere instead of trying to limit yourself yeah yeah exactly so I, I think one of the other things, again, we're, we're going to just go back and forth on things that we really like about the play and what makes the play work well for us. Another thing that it worked well for me was it's a different world and it's one that you wouldn't likely know. So the first time I walked into it, it's largely set in a clock shop. There, there's bedrooms upstairs, but the clock shop is paramount. And um, when I was a kid in Virginia, I grew up in Virginia, um, I walked into a clock shop with my, I think it was my mother, and I got so disoriented by so many clocks and so many sizes all ticking away uh, with those little second hands circling their faces. It was really weird for a very little kid to see that. And in this play, clocks tell time, um, and time is really, uh, the time tell, it, the, the play is about what time tells about these women and men. So you've got the clocks and you've got about time, the time of these women and men. Um, I should mention that in addition to Mortimer, Mortimer and the three failed daughters, there's a brother, John N. Fail, who the others quote, isn't good with people, but ultimately demonstrates that he is good with people. He's just different. But one of the things that's, that's really noteworthy about this play is that time is much too short for the women and very long for the men in this play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Um, I, I kind of like the time theme right now, too, because time right now is very long for all of us <laughs> and space is very short. So it's one location, but time is just this enormous character. Um, I also think about how most plays don't have clocks on stage. And the reason is <laughs> because if, when you have a clock, does it move? And if it's counting time, is the audience in real time? Right. Are you in play time? Like what is time mean when you're watching a play? And this is also an epic, you know, play where it goes, it's going across a year, but you have these, so what do you do with them? Yeah. Uh, how do the clocks tick and sort of the, it's in fantasy time. So all of the clocks are, well, the clocks are characters. The chorus that we talked about before is not just, they don't just play people. They're not just narrating. They're also, the clocks, they're also making the sounds, they're um, being the gramophone, they're being um, animals in the script and things like that. Um, but I don't wanna, let's see, I don't wanna jump to that because we, do we have, okay, because the first thing structurally that it does is, um, and this is kind of a big deal because it breaks a rule, is the first thing the play does and the play has, 13 pages of yeah. exposition. It begins with 13 pages of exposition. Um, and I remember reading this play when we were evaluating it for Wordsmith. And, and I was like, there is no way, there's no way. And I, it kept going and going and going and going, but it was so well done um, that I didn't stop. Um, and, and yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's a really good point because when we were talking about this earlier, it was quite funny. Um, it does have 13, at least 13 pages of exposition and so much of it is at the beginning. And um, uh, as, a, as playwrights out there, you know that Playwriting 101 tells you never do this. Um, uh, it, I think it was attributed to Marsha Norman, who's one of my favorite uh, playwrights also and has written one of my very favorite plays. 
She famously said something to the effect, and I'm paraphrasing, when you sit in a plane, do you want to be idling on the runway or do you want to take off and fly? And I think that's invaluable advice and absolutely indispensable advice for so many plays, but this, and musicals out there, but this one breaks the rule and it's and still it succeeds. Now, I'll be honest, when I first, I saw it before I read it, read the play. And when I first saw it, those first 11 minutes, I was like, okay, what's going on here? Um, but, but, you know, there's a kind of Homeric almost setting the stage and, and giving the characters to it. And, and we were talking before about, you know, it's almost like a um, uh, Euripides, uh, tragedy um, in, in, in that the way that the characters work and the way that we're told about the characters by the chorus, again, the chorus can be anyone, but the chorus is, a, it's the character of the chorus who does a lot of that exposition. There's something really, really wonderful how it ties back to the beginning of Western theater. So that was, that was just one of the things we've been talking about that's, that's been neat. Yeah, and it ties like a lot of ways because Greek, if we're going with chorus, we're going with Greek tragedy. It's like we already know too that fail, failure, a love story from the title, it's a tragedy. That this is not going to be a successful play. He's already, and then the chorus itself tells um, everyone, he says, um, Nelly, okay, this is one of those lines that, that is um, sort of important, but it repeats throughout the play. Nellie was the first of the Fail girls to die, followed soon after by your sisters Ginny, June, and Gertie Fail in that order. Causes of death were blunt object disappearance and consumption, also in that order. So you know that from the beginning. Right. And, um, and so he's kind of just leaning right into that whole tradition. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, we've got clocks on stage, that's a no-no. We've got all this exposition, and we've got what you just said. And, uh, like, the last thing you want to do is give away, you know, the, the spoiler alert at the very beginning. And yet, it still works. That It's just, it's, it's very, it's, it, you, you just fall in love with it in that way. Yeah, well, and then you're immediately asking, what do you mean they all die? And then how is this going to unfold? Mm -hmm. It's completely riveting. It's like... You're, you're completely invested. Um, let's see, we know their fate. Oh, and then the, the use of the gramophone. Is that, are we ready for that? The use of the gramophone. So um, that's another sort of structural element that he uses that is also kind of tied to, because it's a play with music, right? Right, but, that's a great, great thing to say. Yeah. I had a question about that and Melissa helped me out. I was like, Melissa, is this a play or is it a musical or is it a quasi musical? And she rightly said, it's a play with music. Yeah. And that was kind of a fun thing because I think um, one of the sort of, I guess, epic storytellers who also used a lot of exposition. And this is purely an aesthetic connection. I don't think that um, this is, counts as epic theater at all, but it is very Brechtian to have a play with music. Um, in the middle of the play, and I forgot that this happens, and then I remembered, and I remembered that moment, um, the Mortimer, Mortimer, Mortimer does a full dance number, musical number, about how much he hates um, this boy that, that Nelly has a crush on. And it's, uh, he writes it as like a tap dance or something, and it's a whole song that he sings. And that's the only time that a character, a character singing as opposed to like a, a gramophone singing or uh, kind of in the background or something like that. So it's uh, delightful and strange yeah. and it completely works. Yeah. Yeah. So, so another, I'm going to, I'm going to switch to another of the things that that is a kind of signal for me. And we're talking about a tragedy and people dying, and, but we know it up front. But one of the things I have to say about this, um, this play is that I cried when I saw it. And um, it's interesting, part of it was, uh, I, I was actually gonna skip over why I cried, but I'm actually gonna say it now just because I think it's interesting. Um, so when Jenny June, the middleest sister, um, almost makes it to Lake Michigan, and then she, she goes under, um, you, I really felt for Mortimer, Mortimer. I mean, the, the guy was like, I mean, the name says it all. 
but it was it was so sad because then you are I mean you already know what happens to all three of them and you already know that by this point because he'd fallen in love with the youngest daughter and she she got hit she got blunt blunt force trauma and then Jenny Jenny June uh, uh, drowns and now you know he's gonna fall in love or is already in love with Gertie the oldest and that she's going to die too we already know that it was just it hit me the whole structure kind of like hit me in a way and also it was the writing but hit me in a way that just really really got to me um so i, I think that i mean that's really all i have to say I, one of the things that i could say about it is that um uh, these were women who grew grew on me like i said before after that exposition and took the world as it was made made the best of it and the young men who loved them and suffered their deaths suffered their deaths and lived as old bachelor friends until their own deaths. It's not anyone's notion of a love story, and yet what a love story it was. It really is a love story. It's, it's a beautiful love story, and it's so atypical, a love story. Mm. I think I, I have, I, I also cried for that show, but I, this show came yeah right after happened right after like a really bad personal thing and then um i didn't survive the show at all i think i probably started crying at the beginning oh wow <laughs> and then just was but because i knew too because i'd already read it and um yeah the absorption in the way that um, this sense of time and the way that we fill time. There's, there's this uh, quote that actually the playwright has, investing rather than spending time, fulfilling rather than filling it. And um, he has a thing too that I read where the reason he wrote this whole play is because he saw a tombstone that said fail because the family, there was a family and their last name was fail. And so they had this whole grave marker and he just created the entire world from that. Mm -hmm. um, great. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay. Well, uh, and, so go ahead. Um, also, let's see. Oh, we are we on to language? Uh, not, well, we could be on to language if you want. Oh, no, no, let's do the history a little bit. Okay, I, it's just one other thing about it. I, we talked about the fact that it's atmospheric with the clock shop, but it's also, it's, it gives a rich, detailed portrait of Chicago in the early decades of the 20th century. Uh, we learned about things like the Eastland Riverboat Disaster, one of the most horrific uh, in the history of Chicago, and there are a lot of disasters in the history of Chicago. We learned just how filthy the filthy the Chicago River and Lake Michigan were. Um, here's one, Jenny June quote, dove right in the Chicago River among the hog guts and grease cups and never a day was she sick. And you just, <laughs> you just imagine what it was like back there in the, in the aughts and the teens and the twenties, um, uh, what, what, how filthy all of that was. Um, Another quote to suggest that death had not played a prom very prominent role in the fa fail family saga would be absolute applesauce. Now, I'd never heard that one before. It's so clear what it means, but, it, but it, I hadn't heard it before. That quote, the, oh my gosh, that's so good. Um, they, okay, so the, the thing I guess that um, really wraps it for me as a play. So structurally, why this play, like if I were to answer why this play works or something like that as a general question, I would say because it takes the content, the story, the metaphors, the structure, all of it and weaves it together perfectly so that you have, you're spending, you're literally spending time with the play while the play is happening. And you are, um, he invests a lot into rhythm and the whole play is kind of like a it's it's all music and he's so particular with it it's like if you're gonna break a rule you better do it really really well and um when you do it well it 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 kind of launches it 
into a whole nother realm. And that kind of takes us out of, um, okay, we're just watching a play and just like, and it, and it grabs you. So you can't sit back. And um, he always, he constantly plants seeds. He's, it's very literary. Um, he also, it has, it's, it's magic realism, right? So it has this kind of, it reminded me of, because there's a moment where um, Mortimer and Mortimer, after one of the sister di sisters dies, he sleeps for two weeks. And so it makes me think of A Hundred Years of Solitude, if you ever read that with Marquez. And these sort of like, it's, uh, these things can happen. Someone can sleep for two weeks. A bird can talk. And all of this is um, normal in the play, in the world of the play. Not like, oh my gosh, what is this magic? Um, but it's just that world. Um, one of my... And then we're going to get to favorite lines. But I think also one of my, this is a really sad favorite line, but it's also this idea that, because um, I think one of the birds starts picking out its own feathers because yeah. he's lonely. And it says he's um, destroying himself out of loneliness. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. That's a, it is a beautiful line. Um, but but yeah, in terms of memorable lines. But I, before we go there, I just want to say you really brought up a good point. There's there's the structure. Even though he's breaking rules, it's almost like like a clock, or maybe a cuckoo clock, because there is a cuckoo clock that, that's prominent in in this play also. Uh, this play with music, and there's something there's something about a cuckoo clock and the fact that everything is organized well, and you it's you you see you see the structure of it you see that you talked about planting seeds you know what's going to happen when that cuckoo when it goes off on the out the cuckoo is going to come out and so and then the liveliness of a cuckoo is, it, i don't know there's something about that that image that really works well with this play as a whole it's and, and it's, the bird and the oh and the water because like we have this whole river image and we okay. know the the image of the river of time and then also it's about death. So we have the river sticks and, and that kind of idea. And, that, and then the chaos of time and then also the absolute order of time all sort of congealed into like these two images. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's get to some of the lines. So um, the chorus has some of the best ones, I think. Um, one of them is, is uh, it's, just, it's just a silly one, but upon entering the United States, the first order of business for Heiner and Mariska Fellbottom was to have their bottoms chopped off by an overzealous Ellis Island desk clerk. Um, another one that helps give you the picture of, of, the, of the places, the streets of the city were teeming with immigrants, opportunity, and lice. <laughs> That's just so, so vivid and gross at the same time. Um, and then there's, inventive, there's also inventive play on words and phrases. Gertie becomes a master clock worker. Quote, she cuts her teeth on cutting teeth, you know, parts of claws, uh, clocks. And, and then there are memorable lines like, uh, about Gertie, it said, she became in time an expert in time. And mm -hmm. I, I, I love that one. And then also keep in mind that Jenny June Fail was an expert swimmer. And so we swam in the dirty river that we talked about. And... Um, what it says is the quote is her father quote understood his daughter's need to pump herself through the veins of the place, and so anyone who's been a swimmer like me and has swum through rivers and streams in my small town where I grew up, it's just it's lovely uh, pump to pump herself through the veins of the place. Mm -hmm. um, I think that so everyone the sort of key line that everyone references for this play and probably um, a good one to like d wrap up or discuss. And then I, and I like kind of tying it now to today and what we're going through today. But um, it's the moment when John N, and John N was found in um, the river. He wasn't an official brother. He was like an adopted brother. They found him. And it's the, also the idea that the river gives and the river takes away. And, um, he's about to put his dog to sleep um, 
and he, he says something about how the pain, there's a, there comes a time when the pain of living is very close to the pain of dying. And then he says, and the dog looks at him and says, uh, just because something ends doesn't mean it wasn't a great success. Yeah, I love that. That is just, that's priceless. That really is. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a lot of us are looking at a lot of endings right now. And, um, and so that, that line just seems particularly apt. The play seems very apt and appropriate. But um, yeah, just encouraging all of the artists out there that as we're like facing all these endings, they were also just a series of successes. Absolutely, absolutely. Not just artists, I mean, everybody. Everybody's, you know, suffering in so many different ways. Um, that's a beautiful ending, actually. I think to our, to our talk. Um, I think, any, are there any questions? I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna hold on for questions. Should we hold on? Oh, <laughs> oh was it you who said yeah? <laughs> Do we have any? Okay, nothing from audience, if we have an audience. <laughs> okay, that's great. Okay, well listen, you know, this is happening in two weeks, two, one or two other people um, uh, from locally, I guess they're all local, um, will be on and will be talking about a, a favorite play or a play that they think works so well. And that's two weeks, that's two Mondays from now, same time, 7 p.m. So take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay safe. <laughs>